So thanks everybody for coming. Um, we've got about 75 people online as well. So for those of you that are here, if you ask questions, um, definitely um, we're going to try to repeat those. So if you're speaking, or um, we'll, we'll try to get those questions repeated for the folks that are online. This is also being recorded. Um, so if you want to go back and listen to things later, um, we should have everything, everything documented um, for uh, looking at later as well. So uh, to get started here this morning, um, just kind of go through um, our team and our family. Um, my brother Ted and I own the company Nutri-Drip Irrigation. This is my wife and I and our, our kids. Uh, we have eight children, so that keeps us going uh, pretty much all the time. Um, our team, yesterday we had um, in-house training um, for service and maintenance um, items, and we've got a really, really good team that we put together. So it's not just a couple of us doing this, it's a, it's a whole team effort. Um, so feel free to introduce yourselves to the Nutri-Drip guys today. For those of you that are here, reach out to us, and we'll be glad to answer your questions. Um, you're here at, in Northeast Kansas. You're on our home farm operation. Um, my dad moved here, and we started farming in 1983. And uh, my brothers, Galen and Glenn, run our farming operation. Um, I'm a part owner, but I don't get too active in it from day to day. Uh, but this is our home farming operation. We have some main, mainly corn, soybeans. We've started getting into grass seed. We have a couple hundred acres of organic. Um, we have pivot irrigation and drip irrigation, so we have both perspectives here. Um, but located right in the corner there, uh, just south of Nebraska. Uh, we also have a garden center um, that those of you that are here have seen. Um, so we sell plants. The garden center started back in 1993. We got into hydroponic tomatoes, so that's kind of part of our story is is when I was growing up in high school, we, we built uh, greenhouses for hydroponic tomatoes. And for those of you that are familiar with hydroponics, all of the nutrients go through the water. And so when we installed our first drip irrigation system, it was, it was an aha moment for me that now I have the level of control I did in my greenhouses out in a field. We would take tissue samples every week, we would measure those nutrient levels, and then we would adjust it based on what those nutrient levels said. So the, the greenhouses are, are uh, they're still active. We don't raise tomatoes anymore. It's all flowers and bedding plants now, um, but it definitely is, is part of, of where we came from. Back in 2000, the fall of 2012, we installed our first uh, drip irrigation system. Um, we, had, we had installed our first center pivot back in 1997, which we're going to talk about here in a little bit, a little bit more. Um, here in this area, there is no groundwater. Um, we're lucky to get 10 gallon a minute if we drill a well here. So all of our water is, is rainwater that we catch. Um, build storage um, ponds and reservoirs to store that water and then use it um, in irrigation later in the season. Uh, when I was in high school, we had traveling guns. We had four traveling guns at one point on some rented ground. So I've experienced, I have not experienced flood, but I've exper experienced um, uh, traveling guns, pivots, and drip. So I can tell you the, the, uh, four, or the, the pros and the cons of all of them. So like I said, we installed our first drip in the fall of 2012. Um, this is where Nutri-Drip um, people are located at today. Uh, so Taylor Zeltwinger, um, who's here. Taylor, you want to raise your hand? Um, he's up in Morris, Minnesota, right in west central Minnesota. Wyatt Byer um, is in Rock Rapids, Iowa. Uh, Trevor is in, uh, Trevor, here, here he is, standing up in the back there. He's out in Hastings, Nebraska. Uh, Travis Rokey is down by Joplin, Missouri, and uh, Chris Wietrich is not with us today. He's at another event uh, with Precision Planting, but he lives near St. Louis, and Brad Rokey is here. Um, he is, uh, represents us out in Indiana. So that's kind of our, our locations and where we're located at, um, serving a good part of the Corn Belt. This is where we have all installed systems at. Um, we began installing, we installed our own system in 2012. We began installing for others in 2013. Um, we're up to about 150, 160 systems we've installed so far, a little over 10,000 acres. So we're getting to see a lot of country and a lot of different water, a lot of different soils, a lot of different farming practices. And I think that's an important perspective as we talk about agronomy. And as we, as we bring in, as I think about speakers to bring in and, and, and perspectives, perspectives to share with our growers, I think it's important that there's a, it's not just a, a, a small area we're looking at, we're looking at all different kinds of pH, all different kinds of water, 
farming practices um, and different weather patterns. Uh, my brother sent this to me this morning, cut off the edge here, but this is a 15 year um, market chart. So obviously, um, as everybody knows, things are up and cut off. I think we're sitting about right over here now. Um, we're not quite where we were back in, in uh, the early 2012s there, but um, certainly an exciting time to be in farming. Um, there's a lot of interest. There's a lot of interest in what we're doing, um, and, and hopefully we'll be able to, to serve most all of our, our customers who are interested. So, so I'm just going to give a quick overview of what's new, some of the things that we're doing, um, and then we'll get into some more detailed agronomy talks. Um, SDIE, so E standing for effluent. We're doing a lot of work with effluent through DRIP. Um, we're doing a, quite a bit of focus on water quality, which we're going to talk quite a bit about here. Um, nutrient balance, which is why we have Jason here with Next Level Ag. Um, the PTI farm, uh, we'll mention a few things about that. We're working with Vex pretty extensively in University of Illinois, which we have Stephen Schwartz here with us as well today. So first of all, our work with SDIE. Um, Netafim started doing this in California about five years ago, where basically they're taking manure water, getting all the solids out, and then injecting that manure water through drip irrigation. So this is a hog facility that we started working with, I think, three years ago over by Sabetha. Um, and we're taking the, the water right off the top of that lagoon, mixing it in with the irrigation, and we're able to inject that under the ground during the season and, and getting some good experience there. Um, we've gotten a fair amount of experience um, doing this. We've, uh, to date, we've applied about 80 million gallons of dairy manure and leachate water, um, working with some dairies up in Minnesota and South Dakota about three million gallons of hog manure between a couple different sites. So it's, it's a practice that we're getting comfortable with. Um, and this 80 million gallon number is, is, is really um, ramping up our experience level. So we're, we're getting more and more comfortable with it. We don't have a solution for every site, but we're getting closer every day. Uh, next week we'll be doing another test with another piece of equipment. Um, Basically, the only, the only type of barns we don't have a perfected solution for is a deep pit hog barn. Um, if, if a grower has a lagoon, we have a solution for that. Um, the deep pit hog barns are a little bit challenging right now, but we think we've got a, a test set up next week that, that will answer that um, problem that we've got there. So um, this is one of the dairy sites that we're working with. Um, the, what I had here in this picture, this is a solid separator that's kind of a first phase, so it's a screw press. It's a pretty um, well adapted piece of equipment out in the dairy industry. Um, it's basically a big extruder, so it takes out the big particles. And then we're going into the shaker machine, which takes out the small particles. So think of this thing as a big flour sifter, and it's shaking, and, and the, the liquid drops through, and then the solids are discharged off the side. So this is what we're using for, uh, for dairy manure right now. And, and we'll be doing the test as well on hog manure with this here next week. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the successes we've had. Um, here on our farm this year, we had 97 bushel soybeans um, on our drip irrigation. Um, and it took second place with a value of $1.35 premium on protein. So not only are we looking at yield, we're also looking at quality. Um, a few of the other growers we're working with that you may recognize, this is um, Garrett Land and Cattle. And I'll just show you kind of a trend here. So 2016 was his first year with drip. He, he had a 290 bushel yield. 2017, 312, 326. 2019, he was at 357. And in 2021, uh, that's really whited out, it was 387 um, was his yield for 2021. So there's a trend there. He started at 290, he's now at 387. Um, and so those are the things we want to talk to you about today. What are the practices that those kind of growers are doing that's getting those kind of yield levels? Um, one of the other growers we're working with here that we'll show in a second is uh, Dan Lepkus out in Illinois. Kind of a similar story. Um, started in 2015. Um, he was at 299, uh, 315 in 2006, 327 in 2017, uh, 2018, 324. Uh, 2021 he dropped back to 310 so again there's a there's an adaption and a learning that happens with these growers um, this is the Bex uh, the PFR farm out in uh, Indiana so Sonny Beck the one of the, the founder of, of Bex there 
Uh, we worked with him a few years ago, and his goal was to raise 400 bushel corn before he died. So we put a drip irrigation system in. Um, 406 bushel was their yield in 2020. Um, you can see there's another 401 entry, 397. So what are, what are producers like that or um, organizations like that doing to push that yield envelope? And Stephen's going to share some of those um, with us here as well today that they're doing at University of Illinois. Soybeans, 120 bushel soybeans um, out of the Bex PFR farm. Precision planting, we're doing a lot of work with precision planting. This is their PTI farm in Pontiac, Illinois. Um, we've been installing some drip there for the last three or four years. Um, if, you, if you've attended any of the meetings there, uh, Jason Webster, um, who does all the research there, kind of has a top 10 list of what are the things that are given the best return out of all of the, the practices they're doing. Their number one return for the past two years has been drip irrigation, high yield uh, management, and high yield and high management corn. So there's a lot of good research that's going on um, that, that's really um, helping us raise the bar, we feel like, and so we're trying to, how do, how do we take these practices, make them, make them applicable on a field scale, um, and there, definitely there's some growers that are doing that successfully. So one thing I wanted to dive into just for a little bit here is water quality. Um, because this is a big part of, I think, why, why some producers are maybe limited in their production is we're not understanding what's in our water. Um, so we're going to have a demonstration um, this afternoon that Cortland's going to do, but I'm going to kind of give you a little bit of a high-level overview of why this matters. So this is, this is one of our um, pivot irrigated fields, and I'm not picking on pivots here, but this is, this is our, our oldest pivot that we have. It was installed in, in 1997. It was installed in 1997, um, and in 2020, we had a nearly ideal rainfall year. Like, hardly ran the pivots. I think we ran them five inches, um, but we really didn't need a lot of irrigation. Pulled up the yield map, and one of the things that started jumping out off the page at us is we've got a dry land corner right here that was out yielding the pivot area. So we started asking questions, why would that be? Why would we have higher yield on a pivot corner, uh, the, the, the corner yield at 249, underneath the pivot was about 225. And, and so these are things that, that we look at, why, why would something like this happen? Um, we had um, pretty extensive moisture management going on there, um, so we didn't feel like we were over irrigating, um, but definitely something else was going on. One of the things that we've seen as we've gone across the country is there's different qualities of water everywhere we go. Um, we've got a producer down by Joplin, Missouri that I think you could put his, we could put his water in a bottle and sell it. Like it's that good. There's almost no bicarbonates in it. It's soft. It's, it's really nice water. Most of the Corn Belt does not have that luxury though. We've got sodium, we've got bicarbonates, we've got all kinds of things that are happening inside that water in the water chemistry um, that, that are causing problems. And I think from a producer standpoint, when you go spray Roundup or glyphosate or whatever um, herbicide you're using in the field, you're already treating it in your sprayer. In other words, you're addressing this issue, this issue on a small scale because you've had to or else your herbicides wouldn't work. Now we need to start looking at it from an irrigation standpoint. What is it doing in our irrigation water? So just to kind of give you a little bit of a taste of what, what's going on here, the number that we're, we're focused in on is this bicarbonate number. Um, so on this particular water sample, we're looking at 495 part per million bicarbonate. Most of the growers we work with, the bicarbonates are anywhere from 300 to 500. Okay, that's a, that's a pretty common range of what we're seeing. So what is that doing? If you look at the, the cation exchange capacity or the anions in the, in the cations, over here on the, the cation side, you have sodium, calcium, magnesium, potassium, and ammonium. On the anion side, you have chloride, sulfite, bicarbonate, carbonate, nitrate, and phosphate. So if you go back to chemistry class, if you inject a anion, what does it do in the soil? Or what is it doing on the other side? It's binding up, it's tying up something on the, the cation side. And so if you do the math, and you look at 400 part per million, that last test we looked at was actually 500 part per million, that equals 1,100 pounds 
of cations per acre foot of water applied. Now, in northeast Kansas, we're not applying an uh, acre foot. We're probably doing six inches. So you can divide that number in half. But if we're, if we're tying up 500 pounds of cations per acre, those are calcium, potassium, magnesium, all the things we just went and applied. Now we've put our irrigation water out there and we've tied them up. It's not available to the plant anymore. So this was one of the things that, that, that we're doing a lot of work on is trying to understand how to remove bicarbonates, how can we do it economically, um, and, and, and what kind of results will we get. This is just a, a chart or a, a table here of a lot of different water samples we look at. So you can see we're at the bicarbonate columns right here. We range all the way from 984. This is some uh, salty water up in North Dakota. Um, and on this table, we get down to 428. So this is a huge issue um, that, that, that's showing up in a lot of places. This is a map of the United States. These red ones are the, are the high bicarbonate areas. Guess what? It's in most of the Corn Belt, and especially Nebraska, Western Nebraska, Kansas, Central Nebraska, big irrigation areas. Uh, Illinois, we're working with a lot of producers out in this area, and they have really, really bad water. So one of the one of the ways that we verified that this was happening on our pivot north of here that I showed you that yield map on is we went and took soil samples from underneath the pivot and outside the pivot. And, and so here you can, we sent them to Next Level Ag, which Jason can explain this, this test better than I can. But basically what you've got here is this is the, the calcium level that you would normally see on a standard soil sample. And then over here we have the H3A extract, which shows the plant available calcium. And down here is the, the sample from underneath the pivot. So we've got basically 3,000 part per million, um, 2915 that's in the corner. But the plant available night or plant available calcium is 433 versus 337. So in other words, there's a 30%, we've tied up 30% of our calcium with irrigation water. Okay, so all of a sudden this, this, this nutrient that we need in the plant, we need in the soil, calcium is needed in huge quantities, and most of the time we think we don't need to apply it because there's a lot of it in our soil. We've just gone out and tied it all up and it's no longer available. One of the reasons that I think that this is becoming a bigger issue is because the pH of rainwater has changed. So this is 2000, the year 2000, this is really hard to read, um, but we've gone from a 5.4 pH of rainwater to 5.8. So if we, as we've cleaned up the air, we've taken the sulfur out of the fuel, um, this is having a direct impact on, on the, the pH that's coming from the sky, which is impacting what's available in the soil. So this problem is gonna get worse over time. Um, if it's not addressed. I will tell you that the producers in West Texas and Idaho are already addressing this, okay? It's just not being addressed in our part of the world. The guys that are raising potatoes and cotton and, and all those crops, they're already addressing this, um, but we, we, it's something we need to start paying attention to um, in, the, in the Corn Belt. One of the other things that's, that's just a kind of an interesting side note that we did is we went out on that, that same pivot field and looked at what the pH is, is in our soil um, at different levels. So we checked it at, at an inch and a half deep, two and a half inches deep, all the way down to eight inches, and you can see we've got some really bad stratification going on um, in our soil. Um, so just kind of a, a note there that a lot of times we, we focus on taking a six inch core and we think our pH is good. Right? You take this, it looks like it's six or six three. Well, guess what? What was it? At, what was it at all those different levels? And all we did was average them together. Well, where's the plant living at? What What is it getting in that first two or three weeks when it's a little seedling and it needs a good a good shot of, of nutrients? Um, so one of the things uh, that we are working with to remove bicarbonates are sulfur burners. Um, so basically, what this does is it takes a dry sulfur prill. Um, it's kind of difficult to see there, but um, it's basically a dry prill. It burns it, creates a sulfuric or a sulfurous acid, and that reacts with the, the bicarbonates in the water and it removes the bicarbonates. Um, so this is a water sample of an untreated water on the left here and a treated water on the right. You can see the bicarbonates started at 306. After we treated it, they were down to 14. And we lowered the pH in that water from 8.6 down to 6.0. So had a direct impact on the chemistry 
Um, it didn't really do anything else in, in the, you know, there was sodium in this water. We didn't remove the sodium, but we've allowed the sodium now to flush through the soil. So if you have high sodium levels um, and you have bicarbonates as well, that sodium is going to start sticking to those soil particles and, and it'll, it'll just bind up and get tighter and tighter and worse and worse over time. If you remove the bicarbonates, now that sodium can leach. It'll, it'll go on through your soil profile. One of the other questions that we've asked in the last, well, ever since we started irrigating, is can I inject anhydrous into water, into irrigation water? And, and everybody who answered, has ever answered that question says, no, you can't. You'll plug up a pivot, you'll plug up, the only guys that can do it are flood irrigators. Um, that's always been the answer. Well, so we started looking at why is that? And so the demonstration that Cortland's gonna do this afternoon, we're gonna show you what happens when you inject anhydrous into water. It, it creates a cloud. It basically precipitates the bicarbonates and you can visualize what bicarbonates are. So this, this past growing season, we took a sulfur burner, treated the water, removed the bicarbonates, and then we injected the anhydrous and ran it through a drip system with no issues. So I'm not promoting the idea that, that everybody can go do this because it, it's a pretty fine line. You have to keep the pH down. You have, to, you have to make sure the bicarbonates are out or else you could plug a system up really quick. Um, but we've, we're testing this. We're trying to figure out how can, we, how can we safely inject anhydrous into water and I think we're getting closer to a solution. One of the other things we worked with this summer was we took dry um, AMS, just AMS you would spread on a field ran it through a, this is a, a it's called an extractor, um, which was made for compost, so you would dump a dry compost in, it would extract all the, the bugs out of it, and then run it through an irrigation system. In this case, we dumped AMS in there, and so we were, we were injecting AMS into a drip system and through a pivot. Um, we did it too late in the season to see, to get any definitive results, but one of the things that we're looking at is, is how do we get um, ammonia into the corn plant late in the season. Um, I think maybe Jason will probably touch on this a little bit later that we're, we're always focused on nitrate and mm -hmm. after tassel time that plant wants ammonia and how do we deliver ammonia through an irrigation system. So that's kind of my high level overview of things that we're working on. Um, there's, there's, uh, we're always open to new ideas if people, that's one of the ways we learn is people ask questions. Um, why is this happening? Why doesn't this work? How do I make this better? Um, that's what we're here for. We're not, we're not just installing irrigation systems and walking away. We, we, we feel firmly um, that, that if we can help you use the irrigation system to its fullest, um, that, that you'll, be, you'll be back to buy more. So that's our, that's our business model.